In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father in heaven, we bless your name for bringing us together. Thank you because you still give us this opportunity to read your word, to learn from your word. I will pray, Lord, as we stand before the mirror of your word, we'll see ourselves the way you see us in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll see the image, we'll see the superscription of the word upon every heart yielded to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Every work of grace you still need to do, do in every heart. Amen. And every life of obedience you desire to bring forth in everyone, bring forth in each of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us not only to be students of the word or hearers of the word or readers of the word or preachers of the word but the doers of the word in jesus name Amen. prepare us lord for the coming of the lord thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray Amen. Amen. thank you very much you can sit down in genesis you think about the little conversation that Satan had with Eve about a little fruit. And the conversation about the little fruit took a little time. And yet, it plunged Adam and Eve to the fall. And then you have Satan taking over the world because of that little thing that took place in that little corner of the world called the Garden of Eden. I'm sure you have heard about the story of Moses, a great man of God. And I was uh, going from Egypt onto the land of Canaan. It's something I dreamt of and desired for a long time. It's my desire to also get to that land of promise. You remember it was a little fury, a little anger, a little rose, a little, a little thing he said that made him not to get to the land of that Canaan, the promised land. Just a little thing. I'm sure you've heard about Esau. Esau was the person that just got un hungry. Just one afternoon, and it was a little meal that he took that eventually made him to sell the birthright. And he lost the privilege of being called the God of Esau. Now we say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Why didn't Esau make it? Because there's a little time, a little period, a little hunger. And that little hunger he started with a little meal. That little meal made him to lose the birthright. I think you've heard about that prophet, that great prophet of God that went to uh, that Belem Judah. And then he, he went out of Belem Judah and then he declared the word of God. And he obeyed the Lord. Great miracle took place. Signs and wonders. The king said, why don't you come home with me so that I'll be able to satisfy your hunger and your thirst. And said, I cannot do that. Because the Lord had warned me. I mustn't even eat here or drink here. Oh, the man said, that's the prophet eventually that came to him, said, I'm a prophet like you are. A little lie from that old prophet, an angel appeared unto me, and he brought him back. You know the end of the story? A lion killed him, and he died before his time. We're talking about these little things go on and on, all through to the end of the Bible. The Lord had been actually revealing a great thing to John the Beloved in Isle of Patmos. And he almost got to the end, and just a little by a little bend, he worshipped the angel. The angel said, don't you do that. That little thing, that you're transferring the worship you give unto Christ, unto, unto God. You give that unto me, that's abomination. Don't you do that. That little bow, that little worship could have spoiled the very journey of of John the Beloved. Or oh, just saying that as you look through the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you have these little, little things. But it's not only really on the negative, on the positive side, there are some little favors to show. Some little things you do, some little fruit that you bear. It's very little, it has a great consequence. Here is a servant of Abraham. He was by the way. And he just laid everything and said, Lord, you sent me to find somebody, a lady, that will be married to Isaac, the son of Abraham. I'm going to stay here as these daughters of men as they come. And he draw water out of the well. I'm going to just ask for a little drink. And whosoever will give me that little drink will become the wife of Isaac, will become the person at all, inherit the blessing of the Lord with Isaac, the son of Abraham. And here came Rebekah, 
And then the servant of him demanded just a little drink, and she gave. That's what opened the way for her to become the wife of Abraham's son. And then she got the promise that through this family, I'll bless the whole of the earth. I'm sure you have heard also about David. He had lost virtually everything. As was uh, saying, oh Lord, will I recover everything I've got? God said, yes, we're going to recover everything. He was on the way to recover everything. Then he saw this little fellow, a stranger. And they picked him up. He's been hungry and sick. And he gave him a little fruit and a little water. His soul revived again. And that man led them to recover everything they ever, they ever lost. Just a little thing. I'm saying that those little things do matter. Lord, there are people that they don't count those little things as important or essential. But God says it's those little, little things that actually lead you to either a lost eternity or leads you unto an eternity of joy and privilege and a joy, the life of or eternity of a kind of reward and fulfillment. Elijah was, uh, you know, in the famine of three and a half years. And the brook chariots had dried up. And the Lord said, I've commanded a widow woman in Zarephath to, to feed you. And then he came out and saw this woman, just a widow with a son, and had nothing at all. And Elijah said, could you bring me just a little water there? And the wash was good. Can you give me a, meal, a little meal as well? Man of God, I have nothing. I'm just about to cook the last meal so that I eat that and die. And the man of God said, go and do that little thing for me first and then come back. You'll read for the rest of the farming. And she went, just a little cup of water, a little cruise of oil, a little a meal that she gave Elijah. And they were told that she ate all the days of the famine. Just that little thing. That's what made the difference. I'm just telling you that all through the Bible, you have this little, little thing. Good things, little. Bad things, little. And have great, great consequences. Tonight, we're looking at little foxes, little foley, and little fire. Little foxes, a little foley, and a little fire. I'm looking at Songs of Solomon, chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 15. Very important thing, little things with great, great consequences. Take us, the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. Here you have the prayer. It's a prayer, believe out to pray unto the Lord. The foxes, little foxes, the little termites, the little insects, the little animals that will spoil the vine that will have labored for a whole lifetime. The children of Israel, they were farmers, most of them. And then they planted the vineyard, they built the fence around, and they gathered all the stones, all the labor they could give. They gave everything. And then a little fox or little fox could spoil everything. That's why they said, we've done everything we can do. We've prepared everything we can prepare. And we've girded everything, we've surrounded everything with fence. Now, the prayer we pray is that all this great labor, all this great ministry, all this great vineyard, and all this great kind of lifetime investment will not be spoiled by little, little foxes. In your Christian life, how many temptations have you gone through? Persecutions have gone through? How many kind of sacrifices have you made? And how many times have you surrendered everything to the Lord and you are building a kind of guarding in your spiritual life? The grace of God, the love of God, the faith you have in Christ, and everything that you have put together all these many years. And yet now you have to sit back and say, Oh Lord, I've done all this great thing, but take us the little foxes. The little, little termites that will destroy the whole house and the whole edifice. Take us the foxes. Take away. Take off. Remove. Gather away. Destroy all those little foxes that spoil the vines. For vines have tender grapes. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. Dead Flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth his stinking savor. 
It's talking about uh, like a pharmacist. That, that's why that's the original word. The pharmacist is trying to make uh, some medicine to make a cure for an individual. And a little fly or some little germs or that carry a kind of germ bacteria could spoil the whole thing. And if that is administered to anybody, it causes death. That's why it says, so does a little folly, not much, not much, a little frivolity, not much, just a little, a little falsehood, not much, just a little, a little kind of foolishness. A person who has been, you know, leading his life with the wisdom of God, wisdom of the scriptures, and the wisdom of the Holy Ghost, and then just relaxes a little and says, well, I think I've been too firm and too serious and too sober. I've been too serious-minded. I think I need to do just a little relaxation and a little kind of air of frivolity and fleshly lust. Just a little freedom, a little allowance I need to give to myself. And that little foolish spoils everything. Years of service. Years of consecration. And years of devotion. And years of dependence upon the Lord. That little folly, that little frivolity, that little fleshly, act, uh, fleshly action. And that little freedom. Just give me some freedom now. Set us free. Help us to, you know, have some little liberty. And that little thing spoils all the years of faithfulness. I'm coming to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, we're looking at verse 5. James chapter 3, we're looking at verse 5. It says, even so the tongue is a little member. Miriam will tell you that. That the tongue is not even to one percentage of my whole body mass. And yet, what brought leprosy on Miriam? Just that. And you can ask all those people in the Old Testament, just the use of the tongue that brought devastation. There were serpents in the wilderness, and the people just spoke unadvisedly with their mouths because of discouragement. Because this way appears too long and too rough. And then they spoke against God and against Moses. That was it. And you had a lot of them, thousands of them dying in the wilderness without getting to the land of Canaan, without getting to heaven. Just that. Because it says even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. How great a house, a little fire can burn down. How great a project, a little fire and bother how great a family a little tongue can tear apart how great a church how great a ministry a little fire can destroy can consume devastate then you don't find that ministry anymore that's what we're looking at this message today a message that we need to apply our hearts to to give us wisdom to help us in the way of the lord little foxes little folly little fire. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, warning against permitting little foxes. That's what permit means. You can do something about it. You can close the door. You can lock the gate. You can build a fence around your life, around your family, around the church, around the ministry. You can build a fence. You can build a stone wall around what the Lord has given you. The peer of great price God has given us in this church. And the great doctrines of the Bible he has given us. And it's no small part or big part. Everything all together. It says you don't permit those little foxes to come in to spoil the ministry. To spoil the church. Or to destroy our Christian lives. Or to destroy the labor of thousands of leaders and thousands of workers and thousands of pastors. And hundreds of overseers. All over the years, we don't allow these little foxes to come in to destroy. Don't permit it. Number one, warning against permitting little foxes. Number two, wisdom for preventing little follies. Little follies. Just little foolishness. And you'll find that all over the Bible, from Genesis all through to Revelation. The people that are uh, just a foolish thing. 
It's not what you call foolishness, it's what the Bible calls foolishness. Just a little sin, a little folly. And then God says, isn't that foolish? And Samuel tells Saul, isn't that foolish? And then you have the prophet of God come in Nathan. David, isn't that foolish? And then you have the great men of God coming to Solomon. Isn't that foolish? And it starts in a very little way and then expires and expires until you cannot control it anymore. Number three, watchfulness against the power of little fire. Watchfulness against the power of a little fire. We'll come to number one. Number one, we're talking about warning against permitting little foxes. Hey, can I tell you what the Lord is telling us? Look at uh, Songs of Solomon. Songs of Solomon. I'm reading to start with from chapter one before I go to chapter two. Chapter one, I'm reading from verse six. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. They made me the keeper of vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. The danger for some people is to be a keeper of other people's vineyards. They're, looking at, they're not looking at their lives. They're not looking at their families. They're not looking at their consecration, their commitment. They're not looking at all that God has helped them to pray through and to gather together. And the strength they have all these many years, as they go through the world, they'll be throwing the word to James and to John and to Stephen and to uh, Philemon. They, they throw the word to other people. And it's, I wish so and so were here to hear this. I wish so and so will, will pay attention to this. They're trying to keep other people's vineyard, but their own vineyard, they're not keeping. And the Lord is saying, no, don't, don't do that. Don't throw the word to other people. Look at your life. In which way are little foxes coming into your life? It's your family, among your children, in your own little circle, among your friends. In what way are the little foxes affecting your salvation? your sanctification and your seriousness and commitment and everything you've opened your mouth to say to the Lord in the past because the people that will get to heaven are the people that have sworn to their own hurt and they change not so don't look at other people you know at other times the preachers that they're very busy knocking other churches and they will you say you know those other churches they're not working right but you know this church and you know they're, they're talking about the history historical testimony that is many years ago this is where we stood are you still standing there don't suppose other churches just think about yourself knocking others will not make you stand right don't be a keeper of others vineyard while your own vineyard you have not kept i'm looking at now songs of solomon Chapter 2, verse 15. Take us the foxes. Well, to, to even uh, pray to God and say, Oh Lord, we need your help here. We need your help here. The foxes are so small, but they're slippery. You chase them here, they come out the other way. And if you look at the action or the way the foxes behave, they don't walk alone, they don't stay alone. They might go with 40 others and 50 others and all just bombard a particular field and they'll eat all the plants there and just make everything come down completely. That's why it says it's not just one fox because there's a little fox, a little fox there. While we're running after this, then we have another one here. We are trying to trap this and grab this and destroy this. We have another one over there. All we can do is to say, Lord, our strength is not up to this. How are we going to be able to empty all the water in the ocean with just a little cup? As we're emptying the uh, ocean with a little cup, uh, the thing is still increasing and flowing. Therefore, we're praying and say, oh, Lord, reveal the foxes to us and help us because you, you can shine from the light of heaven. And then all the foxes, you can help us take care of all of them, get rid of all of them. All these little, little foxes that spoil the vines because of vines of tender 
graves. Those little things are the things that the Lord is warning us about and he says we should take care of them. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're looking at a verse, looking at a verse 6. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Your glory is not good. Paul the Apostle talking to the believers that call it your glory is not good. They are so full of themselves and so proud. They were looking at the good, good things in their church, the gifts of the Spirit, the power, the revelation, the mysteries of the gospel, the speaking in tongues and interpreting of tongues. And they were looking at you know, all the things that were good. Those good things were there. It's like when you're looking at a building. That the windows are good, the wall is good, the color is good, the roof is good, everything is good. The only problem is there are some termites that are eating up the wood in the foundation. And the termites are walking very quietly. They're very small. And those little, little termites and those little, little foxes, they, they're already destroying the foundation of the building. But the building is still standing and the color is still nice and beautiful and bright. And the roof is still wonderful. It's not even leaking. And the windows, they're special and superb. But the little termites are doing some danger. That's why Paul the Apostle said, you Corinthian Christians, you're not looking at yourself. You're not looking at the hidden things. You're not looking at the foundation. The termites are eating up the very fabric and the foundation of the church. And it says, your glory is not good. Don't you know? Know ye not? That a little leaven leaveness the whole lump, don't you understand? A little yeast will pervade everything, make everything swell up, then it becomes unreal. And that's what the Lord is telling us that there are some little, little things that come in and they will say, That's not too bad. Or oh, you use the word too, not too bad. That's bad enough, but not too bad. It's not perfect, but it's not too bad. It's not like the way we started, but it's not too bad. I wasn't frivolous like this before, but I'm not too bad yet. I wasn't as careless like this before. I'm not too bad yet. It's bad, but not too bad. It is not the standard. It is not the way to live. As a real child of God, it was not too bad yet. I've not gone into immorality, but I know it's not perfect, but it's not too bad. The Lord is telling us all those things that we say, not too bad, not too bad, not too bad. Get rid of them. Your glory is not good. Your pride is not good. You're too confident and overconfident. Don't you know that a little leaven will live on the whole love? Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 7. Galatians 5, verse 7. You did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Here, Paul the Apostle came to the Galatian believers and he said, What am I hearing? What information is passing on getting onto me? Are you the same people I learned of before? I knew you. You could have removed your eyes if it were possible and given your eyes to me. You loved me so much, you could part with your arm and lend me your arm. You love me so much, if I needed a kidney, you could give up your kidney and then I have kidney transplant. I knew you. I knew your love. I knew your devotion. And I knew your seriousness of the word of the Lord. And I knew what you forsook before. And I know what, you know, your history. You did run well. Who has spoken to you? Who is trying to bewitch you? Who is trying to lead you astray? That's why it says, it said, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. This persuasion is coming from another source. The persuasion to change that a little, adjust that a little, and kind of tone this down a little, modify this, adulterate this a little. This kind of persuasion, at the point you begin to say, I see, I see. It wasn't like that before, but you know, this is a new day, a new century, and it's a new kind of attitude. Get free and relax. I don't be, you know, so strict and so straight and so narrow-minded. Things are changing. 
change of the times. And then when you begin to say, I see, you are being persuaded. I understand now. You are being persuaded. I used to feel guilty about that. I used to feel that that is not right, but now I think I can manage that. My conscience is still, you know, saying, ah, watch it, watch it, be very careful. You're going astray a little bit, but I know that it's the old conscience. If, you know, if I keep on doing it, I know that I'll feel free. He said, this persuasion is not of him that calleth you. Then he says in verse 9, don't you know, a little leaven lifteth the whole lamb. It's a little. That's how it starts. Just a little. A little foolishness. A little fraud. A little falsehood. A little deception. A little going astray. A little modification. Just a little. But little drops of water make a mighty ocean. A little anger. A little worldliness, just a little. That's why it says this kind of persuasion that somebody is persuading you now. And then you are, you, everything is changing now. Your outlook is changing. Your wardrobe is changing. Your walking is changing. Your devotion is changing. Your commitment is changing. Your seriousness, devotedness to God is changing. And you're laying everything upon the altar changing you can no more see i surrender all i surrender all. that will not be true the things now you're picked up again you have not surrendered say lord i surrendered this a few years ago but i need it back i gave up this many years ago i need this one back what are we going to do you can cancel that song i surrender all no we just change it a little i surrender some I surrender some. We cannot surrender all anymore. Now we drag things with God and say, Lord, in this modern time, it's difficult now to surrender all. We want to match a society, we want to match the other churches, we want to match the other ministries, and we want to be able to, you know, want the people of the world to look at us and say, hey, this is beautiful. Deep alive. We didn't know you could be like this. Isn't this wonderful? We say, no, sir, it's woeful. This is bad. This is terrible. Because when the people of the world begin to praise you, when they begin to appreciate you, it means you are no more surrendering all. You only surrender some now. Even the sum remaining, you're still going to take it literally away just a few days from now. Look at Luke chapter 6. I'm looking at Luke chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 26. So the people of the world, you know, they feel convenient when they come to our midst. Let's keep them. Those people of the world, without repentance, let's keep them. Without a transformation. Salvation is no more a miracle for them. Salvation is now, you know, we love the way your local church is and we like to join. Now they join. They are not transformed. They are not new creatures. It's just like, you know, I have, you want to have a little cigarette in your mouth so the smokers can come in. You want to have a little drink, a little bottle of wine so that the drinkers can come in and feel convenient. You want to have a little slack, those ladies, so that those uh, ladies outside who are wearing those things, they can they say, uh-huh, now you are people friendly. Now you, we can join you. We don't want them to join. We don't want them to join. We want them to repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and become real children of God. Who wants sinners to join his church? Who wants person to join the church without being converted? Who wants the fraudulent people of the world to join the church without conversion? We don't want them to join. Want them to come and then when they hear the word of God, they fall on their faces in deep repentance and sorrow for sin. And then they turn to the Lord. It's when that change or transformation takes place. That's what happened to me before I came to the church. That's what happened to you when you came to the church. It's by conversion. We didn't make you to like us, agree with us. You couldn't love us. The world didn't love Jesus Christ. He came to change the world, save the world, turn the world around. That's why it says in Luke chapter, two, chapter 6, verse 26, it says, Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you, 
For so did they, did their fathers to the false prophets. When the people of the world begin to praise us, something is gone wrong. And I pray that all those things that have gone wrong in our lives, in our churches, our local churches, our district churches, our regional churches and state churches, God will correct them in Jesus' name. And then we can come back to the cross, come back to Calvary and say, I surrender all. I surrender all to thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. And it is at that point the Lord will take us back again. When we are no more dividing the word of God, this is major, this is minor, this is important, this is insignificant. When we are no more sitting as judges over the word of God, saying, this is permissible, but that's not permissible. Oh, we just know the word of God in its totality is the word of God. Look at your body. If you lose a little finger, you know, say, you won't say that's a little finger. You lose a little tooth, you say that's a little tooth. You lose a little toe, that's not it. You won't say that's a little toe. You lose a little kidney, you don't say that's a little thing. Every part is important. If that's important to your physical body, how about the body of truth? The word of the Lord. Everything we've learned since we came to know the Lord. Everything we've learned since we started reading the word of God. And the Lord has been building this conviction on the word of God in our lives. And then we're not saying, oh, I don't want conviction. That area, that conviction, that area. We want conviction every year of our lives. You have not been to heaven and the Lord is saying what it will take to get to heaven. Is that to take my, the totality of my word. If you continue in my word... Yeah, my disciples indeed. I pray we'll be disciples of the Lord in Jesus' name. Uh, we're looking at Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 3. Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 3. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, here's what it says. But fornication and all uncleanness. How many kinds of uncleanness? You know, there are some kinds of uncleanness that, you know, maybe you say they are minor. That's not too serious. But it says all uncleanness. And you know, as you look at uh, all around you, uh, the people that actually influence the world, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. The people that are influencing out the world, uh, they are not the people of the church. In fact, the church is having its influence from outside. You think about the new styles of dress coming in. Who brings uh, that kind of style? Or oh, the people in Hollywood, the people who are into entertainment, they're not Christians. They're not Christians. They're not there for us. They're there for themselves. You think about the people that, that kind of influence the air due of men and women who are they? They're people of the world. You see them on the billboard. You see them in the newspapers. You see them, you know, in the TV everywhere. They are the people trying to influence and they're trying to push Christ away from the very center and the influence of the world. He is the light of the world, but the people of the world, they're no more taking any cue from him, any example from him, or any example from the church. And the church now is going to the world to learn what the world looks like, how the world dresses, how the world eats, how the world exercises. And the world puts all the, all the emphasis on bodily exercise. No more spiritual exercise, spiritual development, spiritual growth. No more fasting and praying and looking up to the Lord. The church learns a lot from the world. I pray that everything you have learned from the world, the Lord will take it out of your life in Jesus' name. And then you can come back to and say, Lord, nothing of the world in me. Nothing. But everything within, without, around, my past, my present, my future, I want everything to be dictated by the Lord and the Lord alone. That's why the Lord is telling us, it says, all of cleanness. It says in that verse 3, of covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh, becometh who? Saints, neither filthiness. Even little filthiness should not be there. Then it says, and no, or no foolish talking. No, what's the next thing there? Jesting. Jesting. And those of us who give you the gospel by the grace of God, and that's, that's what we learn. That jesting is of the world. All that foolish talk and foolish jokes and you know, just make people laugh and forget themselves and forget their future and forget their lives and forget that they are born again. 
that makes us look like jesters and clowns in the world. It says, even jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. In verse 5, but this she know, that no warmonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. We're praying that all these little foxes, the Lord will take them away from us in Jesus' name. I want to show you something in Daniel. I'm reading Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I pray God will give you wisdom. Give you ears to hear, hearts to understand, and a decided will to follow the Lord, whatever the cost in Jesus' name. We're looking at Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 8. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. It says in verse 8, And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another, tell me, little horn, little horn. The people of the world will not realize that's the Antichrist. When it comes, it's not going to come with a big horn, big drama, just a little thing, a little horn. Uh, let me go to chapter 8, verse 9. Chapter 8, verse 9. It says, And out of one of them came forth a little horn. A little horn. That's how it starts. A little horn. That's how the Antichrist will come. There will be three things you are going to notice. Many things, but three things in particular. In the Antichrist, a little horn. Number one, a little falsehood. Just a little. Not much. Just a little falsehood. That's the way it will start. Number two, there will be a little flattery. Little flattery. Not much, just a little. A little flattery. Number, number three, a little force. A little force. You know, the devil will start with the Antichrist that way. He comes with a little horn. And then there is a little falsehood. Look at verse 25, chapter 8, verse 25. It says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft." deception, falsehood to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall he destroy many. By peace shall he destroy many. You see, that's how the Antichrist comes. If, if the Antichrist wants to come into the church, anti-Christian views, anti-Christian preaching, anti-Christian policy, Anti-Christian doctrine. That's Antichrist. It's not just as you see that, you know, he has a big horn there. Just a little thing. A little crack. A little inroad. And then he comes, first of all, with a little falsehood. Just change it a little. Adulterate it a little. Modify it a little. It is that little falsehood that leads to another thing. Little flattery. Little flattery. Some people cannot stand when you flatter them. They forget themselves. Their heads swell up. You're great. You're beautiful. This is personification of handsomeness. I didn't know you were so wonderful like this. That little flattery, they cannot stand. Everything they built up from the time they became born again. Once you give them a little flattery, everything is gone. Uh-huh. Look at the way you... Did you see yourself in the mirror? I'm telling you, this is something. They are gone. And that's what the Antichrist will do. And when the people start coming to our church, and then, you know, after the meeting, they shake hands with us, and they say, I used to hear of deep alive. And, you know, I, I said, I'll never get into that kind of church. Holiness, purity, righteousness. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. But... Somebody just invited me to be, and I said, I'll give you just a trial. And I came in, and everything I had about you before, that you are, you know, serious and devoted and self-denying, militant, and you're like soldiers, and everything militant and all that. I saw that everything is changed. It's relaxed. Uh-huh. Why, if you were like this so many years ago, I would have come. Many people cannot stand that flattery. And they fall on their faces and begin to worship the Antichrist. I pray God will deliver us. But for you to come back to where you were, 
for you to come back to where the word of God stands and to be able to say falsehood and flattery and false will not get me, will not get you in Jesus' name. And look at chapter, two, chapter 11 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 21. Daniel 11, verse 21. In verse 21, here is what it says. It says in verse 21, and it is a stage shall stand and shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by, tell me, by flatteries. Obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And that's the way the Antichrist will come. Falsehood, flattery. Look at verse 32, the first part of verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by, by what? By flatteries. Look at verse 34. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with what? Flatteries. The Antichrist will come with a little horn, and then he comes in, number one, falsehood, a little falsehood, a little flattery, and then he's going to come in with false. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. That's all he will know. He'll then begin to compel people to deny the sacrifice, to deny self-discipline, self-denial, to deny all the things we ever stood for. We start in little, little ways. And then they begin to put pressure, begin to make fun. When we say false, false doesn't always mean shooting a gun. False doesn't always mean, you know, putting bands in your hand or stocks in your legs. And sometimes false is like ridiculous, you know, just... Uh, already that one is convinced we should go that way, that we go that way. And then you are still standing. And then they look up and down at you and they say, what kind of thing is this? And they ridicule you. And they abuse you. And insult you. And they belittle you. That is pressure. That is false. It starts in a very little, a very little way. And when you do that over and over and over, and you make fun of the holiness and jest and ridicule the righteousness and everything, eventually... Those who do not understand that that is the Antichrist behind that personality, they, they are crushed and then they crumble. I pray God will deliver us in Jesus' name. We will not fall. We will keep on standing in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at wisdom for preventing little follies. Wisdom for preventing little follies. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, I read from verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking sable. So does a little folly him that is a reputation for wisdom and honor. A little folly. A little folly. Now, I need to read a lot of scriptures here for you to understand what the Bible calls folly. Because many people don't understand, you know, maybe if you speak and you say something, oh, they say the man is not wise. Why oh, don't you pray for this man to be wise? He has little folly. Maybe it's, you know, you're trying to decide something and you say that this is what the word of the Lord says and this is the direction to go and we must not remove the ancient landmarks. And once you, once you talk like that, oh, they say, oh, why don't you pray for your pastor? He needs a lot of wisdom. That, you know, if you're going to minister in these days and this age, you need wisdom. He has some, he has some kind of folly, foolishness, because it's true. You know, it's not a people friendly. It's not a this one friendly, that one friendly. Let's look at what the Word of God says on what the Bible calls folly. And then it says, if this is folly, if this is foolishness, you want to be able to avoid that so that you don't get involved with a little folly. I'm looking at 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And we're reading it from verse 11. 1 Samuel chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 11. It says, And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me. 
and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together. Mikmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore. So said, I knew I shouldn't have done that. But you know, I was looking at the community, the environment, and the situation. And you had not come. And then, because you are not around, it's your absence that caused that now. If you had been here, you would have done the right thing and done the sacrifice. And since you were not here, and the people were scattering away from me, I wanted to gather the people. I wanted the unification of the people. And I wanted to go on with a mighty force and a mega force, so to say. But because you were not there, I forced myself and offered a bunch offering. Look at this in verse 13. And Samuel said unto Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. That's the folly. That's folly. When you know that this is the will of the Lord, this is the word of the Lord, this is what he has said. But you begin to use your own human sense, human knowledge, human understanding. And you're saying, if we follow this according to what is written, according to the word of God, the people will scatter. If we follow this according to the word of God that is written, we'll not be able to unify the people. Uh, young people will not even come. They will not join. And then to make them join, to make them cooperate, to make them agree with us, we force ourselves. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, you know, get in that direction. It's just the situation that compelled me to do that. It says that is folly. And it says you should go and pray for wisdom not to allow that impatience and that taking loss into your hand to force yourself to do anything for the sake of the kingdom it says that is foolishness look at that whole verse in verse 13 and Samuel said unto Saul that was done foolishly thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee for now will the Lord have established the kingdom upon Israel forever but now thy kingdom shall not continue look at that little thing that little thing that little folly that's what made him to be just like that I'm, I'm looking at uh, Psalm 85 we're looking at folly and he's saying don't get involved with that little folly Psalm 85 I'm reading from verse 8. Psalm 85, verse 8. It says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. When you go back to your vomit, that's going to back to folly. The things you rejected before, the things you told the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not going to be a saint anymore. I'm going to be a saint, a, a righteous man, a righteous woman. And then your life changed, your heart changed, your attitude changed, your dressing changed, everything changed. And then you go back to the folly, to the foolishness of the world that you draw before it says, that's a little folly. Don't go back to that. I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. I read from verse 20 all through to verse 23. Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 20 that the Lord will keep you away from that folly, foolishness. Will keep you away from that little folly that makes your Christian life to not be rejected, not acceptable to the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse 20, it says, And why will thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holding for the courts of his iniquity. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. In the greatness of his folly, when you read everything he's talking about, a strange woman influencing you with their eyelash or their whatever lipstick or with their appearance or whatever. And then they now make you to say, well, looks like this is beautiful. Why don't they allow our ladies to do like this and to do like that? So we have this kind of change. And then eventually they, those people come in and they mess you up. And then your life, no more righteousness. You embrace 
the bosom of a strange woman. Somebody is not your wife. And then you begin to cry out, could I fall so much like this? It started with a little folly, little appreciation of those who are worldly, little appreciation of those who are not obeying the word of God. And then you are trapped. I don't want to say attracted because it's trapped. You are trapped with all their evil look and evil appearance. And it says, it's folly, it's foolishness. I pray it will not grab you. Amen. And I pray that the people of this world will not have any road in your life to destroy you in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26. I'm reading from verse 4. As I'm not a fool, according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. You know what that says? A fool has folly foolishness. Your place of work, it might be that some workers, they behave a particular way to you. And you are quiet, you endure it, you know, that's your persecution, that's your trial, that's your cross, and you bear it. But one day, somebody begins to tell you that <laughs> you continue like this, they'll dump every dirty thing in front of your door. All the things they're doing, if you don't Pay them back. Give it back to them. They do like this. You just say, when they slap you on the one cheek, turn the other. How can you do that? The people of the world, that's what they call foolishness. That's what the Lord calls righteous wisdom. But then, eventually when it gets to you, you say, okay, I'm going to answer the fool according to his folly. I'm going to give it back to them. You know how to insult? I will insult you too. You know how to abuse, I will abuse you too. You know how to say that, I'll say that to you. And then you copy them. And you walk in the same policy in which they are walking. And it says, that is foolishness already. That's the folly the Lord is saying. Don't be caught with that kind of little folly. Just a little trial of giving it back to them the way they gave it to you. Look at verse 11. In verse 11 it says, as a dog turns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. As a dog turned to his vomit, all the things you vomited before, you confessed before, you rejected before, and you kind of threw away before. Now when you go back to pick them up, and you're saying, why did I throw that away? Now I need to get money to get that again. You're returning to your folly. And it says that little folly we shouldn't allow in our lives, I pray they will not come back. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, I'm reading verses 5 and 6. The wisdom to prevent little folly in your life. Maybe you had a particular kind of lifestyle before you came to know the Lord. And after you knew the Lord, God cleansed you, changed your life. Maybe either that you are a man, but you are kind of running after women. They call them womanizers. And now you are totally free. You can just walk free now. Righteous without. Righteous without. But of late, looks like you're looking that direction again. Of late, maybe you saw some old photograph of an old, dirty, defiled, defiling girlfriend. And then your mind is going back to that again. And you began to wish in your heart, I wish I would even meet her on the way one day, just, just to greet her, not to do anything foolish, but just to, I just remember her. Your mind is going and going and going back to that. And all of a sudden, one day, you see her. And then all the things of the past will come back in your mind again. And then you are not careful, you go back to your folly, to your foolishness, to your adultery, to your fornication, to the uncleanness, to the defilement and the filthiness. Maybe a woman. Now you are born again, you are a child of God. But you were foolish in the past. And there were men that destroyed your life, messed you up. Then you came clean, you came to the Lord, born again, saved, cleansed, a new creature in Christ. But all of a sudden, maybe you had a dream. You saw that old man, you saw that old friend in the dream. Then you woke up, instead of praying it up, it's like, I wish I could see him again. Because I recollect the good old days. Those are bad old days, sinful old days, hellish old days. But your mind is going back to the man again. Eventually, you meet together. Maybe you meet other new friends, and then foolishness has come back. Filthiness has come back. 
immorality has come back. That's what the Lord is saying. That we shouldn't return back to our folly. You will not return in Jesus' name. We don't know when the Lord Jesus will come. Maybe very soon. Maybe at morn. When the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And those of us who are alive will be caught away together with him. When he will come suddenly. I pray that at that time you will not have gone away back to your folly in Jesus' name. That's why the Lord is warning us and is saying, Go, don't go back to your folly. Don't go back to your foolishness. He's telling us in that, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 5, verse 6. There is an evil which I have seen under, under the sun, as an arrow which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity. You see that? Folly is set in great dignity. Now, look up here. What does the media do today? The media says folly, foolishness, filthiness, in great dignity. They make foolishness to appear good. They make all this scanty dressing of ladies to appear good. They say that's the real thing. They say that's the way to dress. In fact, they are not teaching people to dress anymore. They are teaching people how to undress in the public. And a lot of the anatomy of the body, you can see outside. You almost see their nakedness. They cannot bend down to pick anything. You see what you shouldn't see. Both at the back and in the front. But the people of the world, they make that look like glamorous. They make that look beautiful. They make that look good. What if you were in the past in some villages, the children will stone you right now? Everybody thinks that that is the real fashion of the day. That's a good thing. Look at verse 6 again. Fully you search in great dignity and the rich search in low places. I pray that God will grant us the wisdom to actually live the life we ought to live in Jesus' name. So that the foolishness of this world will not catch up on us in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Galatians chapter, chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, I'm reading there from verse 1. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, O foolish Galatians. They've gone back to their folly. Galatians they were born again before. And Paul, the apostle, said, are you the same people I knew before? Things are different now, but are different in a bad sense. So it says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It's like a witch. It's like a witch. What is something sometimes like a witch? All these passion of the world is like somebody bewitching you. Well, because there's a spirit behind it all. And then grabs your mind, they won't even allow you to think. You forget all the scriptures you ever learned, all the convictions you ever had. You forget everything. That's why it says, Who has bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Then it says in verse 3, Are you so foolish? Are you so foolish that what even babes in Christ can see? That this is not right, that you, you have, you know, kind of brought them back again. Haven't begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? The Lord is telling us that all those, all the folly of the past, we are going to reject them and throw them away in Jesus' name. I thought you will say amen. amen. Point number three, now watchfulness against the power of the little fire. Watchfulness against the power of the little fire. I'm looking at James chapter 3. James chapter 3. I'm reading there from, from verse 3. James chapter 3 verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small hand, whithersoever the governor listeth, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, 
how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Look at verse 6. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on, tell me, the fire of hell is saying that the tongue is a little fire. Now, was it only James that thought about it like that? Was inspired of God to say that? That has been on, even from the Old Testament. Look at Psalm 57. In Psalm 57, I'm reading there from verse 4. You'll see that the tongue has always been likened, likened to fire, devouring fire, consuming fire. Psalm 57, verse 4. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire. I'm living among them, growing among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Their tongue a sharp sword. Because of the use of their tongue, that's why they look like fire. Look at Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16. We're reading from verse 27. A tongue, a world of iniquity, real great fire that burns down churches, burns down ministries, burns down men and women, burns down conviction. The tongue, terrible. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 27, it says, An ungodly man diggeth up evil. In his leaves there is a burning fire. In his leaves, there is a burning fire. And that's what the tongue of man is. You need to keep that thing in check and keep that thing in control. And look at chapter 26 of Proverbs. There are people that play with such fire. They're destroying families and destroying themselves and destroying churches and ministries. They say, but oh, just playing or just joking on that. You take that serious? They say, how is it you take everything serious? Well, just, I just throw that out to just make everybody laugh, just to make them have a nice time. But you're destroying us with the way you're using your tongue. And for you, it's a play. It's burning us. It's burning our conviction. It's destroying our church. I would say it's play. Chapter 26, verse 18, Proverbs. As a madman, who cast a fire brands and arrows and dead. So is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, I'm not I in sport. I was just playing. I'm, I'm, I'm not I in sport. And yet they are casting fire brands. And they're destroying. Very destructive. This tells us as we go on to verse, verse 20. Where no wood is, there the fire goes out. So where there is no tail bearer, the stripe ceases as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire. So is a contentious man to kindle strife. The contentious people are the people that argue when we hear the word of God, we read everything from Genesis all through Revelation about little things and little things and little things. And at the end of it, they come out and they want to confuse other people. They come on here. Everything you had, do you accept that? Do you believe that? And they become contentious. They become argumentative. And they will not allow you to rest and say, I lay everything back to the altar again. You don't allow such people to destroy your lives. I pray God will help you in Jesus' name. Let's come back to this, James chapter 3, and see the consequence of that little fire, that little tongue, that little member of your body that will want to burn down the church and burn down the ministry and burn down the family and scatter marriages and destroy quite a lot of good, good things. A little member, a little tongue, a little fire that consumes good things. It tells us in James chapter 3 verse 5, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Then it says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And it says, so is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. Tell me the rest of that verse. Say it out loud. It's set on the fire of hell. That's the consequence if you hear the word of God and you say, 
You want to continue with your little foxes and your little foley and your little fire, your little member. The end is hell fire. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Reading from verse 21 and verse 20. Here is what it says. Ye have heard that it had been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, This is the issue of your tongue now, your little member with a little word, whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, tell me, shall be what? Shall be in danger of hell fire. That is, whosoever use abusive language, insultive language, just the use of the tongue. And, you know, because, you know, if I keep on accepting that from people, they'll be dumping it on me. If I don't fight back, if I don't hit them back, if I don't knock them back, if I don't put some words that will kind of make their head turn, make their, make their tummy turn, if I don't say that, they'll keep on doing what they're doing. They'll think they can just approach me like that. I need to, you know, be tough before them so that they don't say that to me again. They'll say, thou fool. And Jesus said, you'll be in danger of hell fire. Let's look at Amos chapter 5 verse 6. Amos Chapter 5, verse 6. Seek the Lord, and you shall live. Lest he break out like fire in the house of Jacob, and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. It says, seek the Lord. You've seen little fool in your life. Seek the Lord. Repent. Come to the Lord. Otherwise, the Lord will come with fire, and burn, and devour with judgment. You have those little foxes of allowed and they're destroying every corner and every, every, every cornerstone in your own Christian life and the foundation of your Christian life. All the termites and the foxes are destroying. Seek the Lord and say, oh Lord, I'm sorry for this. And repent in dust and ashes or fasting before the Lord. And say, oh Lord, this will not happen again. He says, otherwise, the Lord can arise and then there will be fire that will break out and then you'll not be able to contain. I'm looking at um, Jude verses 7 and 8. Jude verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, Oh, you see, I'll never do that. Uh -uh. It begins in a little way. Just a little way. Just a little play. It takes a little thing. You open a, po a little, a little, a little. It becomes a kind of compulsive uh, adulterer, compulsive fornicator. You'll not be able to resist again. It tells us over here. And then going after strange flesh, they are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The vengeance, the judgment, the punishment of eternal fire. Likewise, also these feel the dreamers, defile the flesh, despise dominions, and speak, that's the tongue, that's the tongue, speak evil of dignities. Speak evil of dignities. They use their tongue and then they are now in danger of hell fire. What are we to do? What we are to do is to balance it up. What does that mean? The Lord is saying that, as you've seen, that there's been little folly. Instead of allowing that little folly in your life, you want to kind of build up little fortress, fortification. That is, all these foxes, they're trying to come in to say, I know why. There's a little crack there in my consecration. There's a little crack there in my absolute surrender. And then you say, I'm going to build up a fortress. It's a fortification that will work against the foxes. And then you see a little bit of folly. Little folly, little folly. What do you do? You then build that up with faithfulness. You counteract all the foolishness with faithfulness. I'm not going to consecrate, commit my mouth, my heart, my thought, my life. I consecrate to the Lord. I'm going to be faithful to the Lord in little, little things as well as in big things. I'm looking at Luke chapter 16. 
Luke chapter 16, I read from verse 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is uh, he that's unjust in the least is unjust also in much. And so, with the little foxes, build fortresses, fortification, so that those foxes will not be able to enter again. They will not enter in Jesus' name. With the little folly, surround yourself with faithfulness, faithfulness, Faithfulness to God, faithfulness to your husband, faithfulness to your children, faithfulness to your parents, faithfulness to your wife, faithfulness to the church, faithfulness to your leader, faithfulness to the one that God has used to bring you into the kingdom in little, little things. And whatever you know, in your little district, in your little group, or your little house, your little community, if the pastor, if the GS were here, he would not approve of this. That's where your faithfulness comes in. Even though he's not here, I'm going to be as faithful as if he were here physically. That's faithfulness. And then, how do you overcome the little fire? That means we're going to have little forbearance. That is, you know, when your mind think, I should talk, I should abuse them, I should fight back, you're going to have some forbearance. That means self-control. That means patience. That just hold it back a little. That means a little delay. And look at the word of God. It's telling us in Psalm 39. Psalm 39. I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 39, verse 1. A little check. A little forbearance. A little delay. I won't talk now. I won't talk now. I feel hot now. I feel so disappointed now. I won't talk now. Delay it a little. I feel, I feel so bad. Now, delay it a little. It is that little forbearance, that little delay, that little self-control. Eventually, everything will evaporate. Then you go your way and live your Christian life. And don't betray any kind of uh, demonic attitude or satanic attitude or the attitude of the little harm, little falsehood, little fraud, little filthiness, little fury, little anger. In Psalm 39, I'm reading verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Keep it, keep it in, hold it in. And don't say things that will eventually become a little fire. I'm looking at Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 12. What man is he? that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile, deception, crutch, falsehood, something that is not absolutely true. Psalm 141, verse 3, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and keep the door of my lips. Keep the door of my lips. I just have to overcome that little fire that wants to just break out and destroy your life and destroy your commitment and destroy your righteousness and destroy your marriage and destroy the church and destroy your destiny. Verse 4. Incline not my heart to any evil thing. To practice wicked works with men that walk iniquity. And let me not eat of their dainties. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 13 verse 3. Proverbs. Chapter 13, verse 3. Let there be forbearance, patience, delay, self-control, self-denial. Don't allow your mouth to give you away. Don't allow your mouth to destroy you with that consuming fire. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. He that keepeth his mouth, keepeth his life. He that keepeth his mouth, keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 27. Proverbs 17 verse 27. He that has knowledge spareth his words. 
he that has knowledge spareth his words. The people that don't have the knowledge of heaven, the knowledge of the future, the knowledge of hell, the knowledge of the future, future punishment for sinners, they just, they just talk. They talk, 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 without any control. But he that has knowledge spareth his words. A man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23. Proverbs 21, verse 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue, keepeth his soul from troubles. That's the way to keep away from all this trouble. Keep your mouth. Meditate upon the word of God you have heard. Don't be giving to too much talking, talking. Don't be talkative. Meditate upon the word. Soak in the word. Sink in the word. Pray in the word. And then lay everything back on the altar again. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost begin to burn. And burn the world chaff from your life. And then say, Lord, I brought everything back to the altar. I'll never go back anymore. And God will help you in Jesus' name. Let's rest up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That everything the Lord has taught us today, removing all the little follies and all the little foxes and all the, the little fire, that the Lord himself will give us wisdom. Help us to be who we ought to be. Saying, oh Lord, here am I. 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 What I see not, teach thou me. If I've done iniquity, I will do that no more. If I've gone astray, oh Lord, I will not do that anymore. Remember you started your Christian life many years ago? Remember you repented with tears and sorrow for sin? Remember, you laid everything upon the altar. Remember what God, how good God has been to you since that time. Remember your salvation. Remember eternal life. Remember the tears of Jesus. Remember the agony of Jesus. Remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Calvary. Remember the bloody shed. All to him I freely give. I will ever, ever, ever love and adore him. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to thee. My blessed Savior, I surrender all.